Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Lovely to see you here this morning. Uh, so glad that we've been able to gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, come to worship him today. We're also staying for lunch together, so if you um, haven't signed up and you do want to stay for lunch, uh, do stay. There'll be enough food to go around, and we can share lunch together afterwards. Songs this morning are going to be up on the screen. We're going to be using that, although you do have a, a sheet for one of the words. We'll come to that uh, later on in the middle of our service. Listen to God's word. Uh, the last of the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 134, encourages us with these words. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. And we pray that God will bless us as we gather together this morning to praise him, the maker of heaven and earth. We're going to stand, if we're able to, and sing two songs. Uh, the first is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And then I'll pray, and after that, we'll remain standing to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. So if you're able to stand, please stand, and we'll sing together. pray together. Father, we praise you, the God of grace, for you are good and faithful and loving and kind. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. You alone are God. You are the one who's made us and we are yours. Lord, we come to you this morning as your people, the sheep of your pasture, praising you for your goodness and your love that endures forever, your faithfulness that continues through all generations. Lord, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, and our heartfelt prayer is that we might walk in your ways, that we might see your glory, that we might delight in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So by the power of your Spirit, Lord, would you enable us to give you praise for your goodness and love and faithfulness this day. 
For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness. This morning is to trust me I would like you all to close your eyes so you're only going to close your eyes because Mark's going to put up the PowerPoint because we can't blank the screen so this is the equivalent of blanking the screen uh, by you closing your eyes because otherwise you'll see the answers on the screen uh, that are going to be from the beginning there we go and you can open your eyes again there we go fantastic and if you go to the next slide you'll see the word lunch because we're having lunch together today, and that's a great thing to do, isn't it? We're going to enjoy time with one another and great food. And the wonderful thing about having lunch together is that you then see what other people have brought along. And you go, oh, great. I normally eat that, but oh, I can eat this. And I, I don't even know what that is, but I'm going to have a go at it. So we're going to have a little bit of a, uh, let's have a look at the next slide. Um, a bit of a quiz to go, right, okay, can you recognise what you're not eating today? Uh, so does anyone know what these signs are? Can anyone tell me? What's this one here? It's McDonald's, yes. And that one? Subway. And that one, of course, is a bit of KFC. There's the answers on the next slide. 
Uh, there they are, correct, McDonald's, Subway, KFC. But what about the next slide tells us we're going to have a bit of a taste test. So I, I need a volunteer. Eleanor, would you like to come and help me? I've got some food here. Um, and, uh, oh, what was that for me? Was that? Okay, you look up. That right, now, we were, we were with the mum's then, we were all closing our eyes, so I'm going to have to trust you to close your eyes, and then, then you put your hand in here, and there's something to eat in one of these, and then you have to tell me what it is, okay? So just by tasting it, all right? So can you close your eyes? There you are, and then put your hand in the pot and take something out of there and pop it in your mouth and eat it and tell me what that is. What do you think that is? Raspberry. It's a raspberry. Well done. There are raspberries in there. Well done. Okay, close your eyes again. Let's have another go and put your hand in that pot and tell me what's in that one. <laughs> that was a good pull of a face. That was a, what's that? That's grapes, well done. We've got one more, you're good at this. Okay, close your eyes again, last one. Put your hand in there. Oh, it's finished your grape first. Uh, put your hand in there, take one of those, and put that in your mouth, and... Uh... What's that? Can you tell me what that is? It's chocolate, isn't it? You can, you can take your, 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 your iPad and go and sit down again, because you're right, it's going to take a little while to get out. Now, now, over lunch, it's not going to be a blindfold taste test. You're not going to have to just go, oh, well, I'll just give it a go. You, you can see what's there in front of you. But food's really important, isn't it? And in the Bible, food's really important. Here's our picture of uh, Jesus with, uh, he just had uh, the five loaves and the two fish. But listen to what he said when he got the food. It's on the next side here. It's in Luke 9, it's in all the Gospels, but Luke 9, uh, 13. The disciples said to Jesus, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of about, about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. But listen to what Jesus did there right in the middle. Jesus, uh, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. He gave thanks for his food. And it's one of those things that we, we kind of do every day, but it's really important, isn't it? Maybe over your, your cornflakes this morning, you were just about awake enough to go, thank you, Lord. Maybe just before lunch, we will make sure we pray and say, thank you, Lord. But isn't it wonderful to say, well, whether it's raspberries or grapes or chocolate you can say thank you lord for this food and here's jesus and he's praying to his father and doing an amazing miracle and here he is now at the last supper and he does the same thing he raises the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it so two things boys and girls moms and dads adults to think of this morning one let's give thanks for our food it's something we're eating all the time throughout the day and yet really important to stop and give thanks to God. But then let's do what Jesus did and give thanks to God for the bread, particularly for Jesus, the bread of life, the one who gives us life in all eternity, and give thanks to God for him. We're going to do that right now as we pray uh, before we sing our next song. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our daily bread, for the food that you give us to eat, and we thank you, whether it's raspberries or grapes or chocolate, we praise you for your goodness and your grace to us in giving us food to eat. Thank you that we've had food to eat this morning. We will enjoy food with one another this afternoon. Lord, you are gracious and good. We want to pray for those in our country today who struggle to put food on the table. Lord, help us to be generous and gracious, we pray. And Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, who is the bread of life, the one who gives us life in all its fullness. May we eternally give you praise for him, for we ask this in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together about the Lord Jesus, and uh, this is where you might need your uh, one of the sheets that was handed out to you at the beginning, uh, because the, the words will be up on the screen, but they come up perhaps a little bit late as you're trying to sing them, so you might need the words in your hand. But it speaks of before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love.
whoever lives and pleads for me. Let's stand as we sing together. seat. Well, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come to God our Father as we pray together this morning. You'll see also on that sheet in front of you is the Lord's Prayer that we'll say together at the end of our time of prayers this morning. We're going to be praying for uh, one another. Uh, particularly, we're going to be praying for, uh, we're going to be praying for you, Bernard, uh, as you go into hospital this week on Tuesday, as you have your operation on Wednesday. Pray the Lord will really bless you and uh, work through the surgeons there for your good. We're also going to pray for others in the fellowship and for one another as we come through the Lord Jesus to our Father God this morning. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are our light and our salvation. And we seek you this morning. We come before you to see your goodness in the land of the living, to gaze upon your beauty. To pray that we as your people might be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Father, we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace this morning. Thank you that we come in the name of Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, our Saviour and King. Thank you, as we thought about last week particularly, Father, Son, you have sent your Spirit 
that he dwells in us and we rejoice in your gracious gift, your gracious gifts of every spiritual blessing that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray today that by the power of your spirit, you would set our hearts on fire with love for you, both now and forever. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your words are sweet to the taste, sweeter than honey in our mouths. We thank you that your word is precious to us. Your commands give us life. They are more than the finest gold in our hands. <laughs> Father, your word tells us about your marvellous will for the world. Unending is your love. And so we sing your praises this day. We rejoice in your good and true promises. Blessed be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Father, for this day, we would come to you and pray for our church. Father, for one another, we pray that we would follow the Lord Jesus Christ by the help of your Spirit. That we would be active in working to seek to make Jesus known. That we would seek and save the lost. Lord, we see so many people around us who are lost and without hope. Lord, give us compassion and mercy, we pray. Give us a heart to speak to those who are lost of your love and your grace, of your forgiveness and the salvation we find in Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we pray for our children and for our youth work. We thank you for Samantha and all that she does and pray for her this morning as she serves the church at Risley. Help her in her many activities throughout the week. Give her grace and strength as she serves both here and in Risley. Give her the energy and compassion she needs to love and serve you in her daily life. Father, we pray for one another and pray for those who are facing operations this week. Pray particularly for Bernard as he goes into the hospital on Tuesday for his operation on Wednesday. Lord, bless him and keep him. Thank you for the skill of doctors and nurses and surgeons and we pray that that will go well this week. For all of those, Father, in our fellowship who are, who are ill and facing operations and difficult times for, for, for Mick and for Stella, we thank you, Father, that Mick is back home now. But we pray for him as he awaits his results uh, from his biopsy. Lord, bless and keep them in your love and tender care. We pray too for those at home, for Ruth, for Judy, for others, Lord, who we know and love who would like to be with us this morning. And whether they're ill or on holiday or whether they're just not able to be here this day, Lord, thank you that wherever we are, you are there also. If we go up to the highest heights, you are there. If we go down to the deepest depths, you are there. Father, we pray for one another that we would remain steadfast in our love and commitment to you. And both as individual Christians and together as a local church, we would follow the leading of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. So we pray, Father, help us to grow in godliness. Help us to be faithful to your word. Enable us to be servant-hearted, that we may joyfully follow your lead for our good and for your glory. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, Tina is going to come now and bring us our first reading from Esther. Thank you. So I'm reading Esther 7, and it's on page 506 in the Church Bibles. So... The king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther, and as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked, 
Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. <coughs> king Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went out into the palace gardens. But Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. <clears throat> Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows, 70 feet high, stands at Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Thank you so much, Tina. We're going to carry on a reading just after we sing, but we're going to sing again now uh, a second song, uh, another song or rather, um, while the children leave us and go off to Sunday school. We're going to sing together, O Church, Arise and put your armour on, hear the call of Christ our captain. <coughs> As we stand and sing this, uh, Philly's going to go out uh, to Sunday school.
please do take a seat. <clears throat> um, Theo is going to come now and read to us uh, the next chapter of Esther. Thank you, Theo. Esther chapter 8. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over <coughs> Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. He begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favour and thinks it is the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised, and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew. Because Haman attacked the Jews, and I've given his estate to Esther, and they've impaled him on the pole he set up, now write another decree in the king's name, in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. At once the royal secretaries were summoned. On the 23rd day of the third month <coughs> of the month of Sivan, they wrote all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers, who wrote false horses especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of the enemy. The day appointed to the, for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adol. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on the enemy. <coughs> the couriers riding the royal horses went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, with feasting and celebrating and many people of other nationalities became Jews because of fear of the, the Jews had seized them.
Fabulous. Thank you so much, Theo, for reading that. And uh, do keep your Bibles open at that, those uh, two chapters we're going to look at together this morning. Just summed together, haven't we? We're faced with trials on every side. We know the outcome is secure. And we know that to be true because of God's goodness and his faithfulness. Now, 100 years ago, in 1923, uh, Thomas Obadiah Chisholm, which I think is always a great name, isn't it? Oh, should have called children Obadiah, that's a great name. Uh, he wrote a poem about God's faithfulness over his lifetime. Now, uh, Thomas Chisholm, he became a pastor but had to stop after one year because of ill health. And most of his adult life, he worked as an insurance salesman. And as a humble man, he once described himself as, well, I'm just an old shoe. Which I, I, don't, know, I don't know anyone who would describe themselves as, well, I'm, I'm a bit of an old shoe. You know, he's just, I'm just an ordinary person, was his kind of expression. He didn't face any great tragedy in his life. He didn't lose any family in great tragic circumstances. He wasn't a charismatic preacher. There weren't thousands of people flocking to his church week in, week out. Yet he recognised throughout his life God's faithfulness to him. God is seen not only in the spectacular, he said, but also in the mundane. And once again, the Lord provided him with another job in insurance sales. And he had to move from uh, Kentucky to Indiana to New Jersey. And he wrote this. <clears throat> From Kentucky to Indiana to New Jersey, you've cared for us, Lord. Thank you for your great faithfulness, O God, my Father. Never have you forsaken or failed us. Day after day, by your hand, everything we've needed, you've provided. And then, of course, he goes on to write, inspired by Lamentations 3, the song we sang at the beginning of our service, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And today we're going to be looking at Esther and thinking about God's faithfulness to us, sometimes through the spectacular, but often just through the mundane and ordinariness of everyday life. We're going to see God's faithfulness in his perfect timing, yet again in the book of Esther. We're going to see God's faithfulness to his people, and we're going to see God's faithfulness in his salvation, his amazing deliverance of his people. And as we see those three things, it's going to cause us, I hope, and pray to do three things. To act, to love, and to rejoice. So the response of action to God's faithfulness, the response of love, and a response of rejoicing. Now, we left Esther back a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? We, we left Esther herself, having fasted and prayed for three days, having done banquet number one, she's now preparing for banquet number two. That's where Esther is. We left King Xerxes having had a bad night's sleep. He couldn't sleep in the night, but thankfully that helped him to read the history or have the history of his, his life and works read to him. And he suddenly realises we've not honoured Mordecai with anything. And with a bit of help from Haman, he gets Mordecai honoured by Haman. And we left Haman, who was happy at one point and in high spirits, being really angry, plotting to kill Mordecai, and then having the all the dishonour of having to honour Mordecai through the streets, the very thing he wanted done to himself. He'd gone back home to his family and goes, this is awful. And they said, well, the Lord God's against you and his people, so you haven't got a chance, have you? And then he gets dragged off to banquet number two, the very banquet he was looking forward to going to. And that's where we get into in Esther chapter seven this morning. Another day, another banquet. You know, it's a hard life living in the citadel of Susa, isn't it? But look at verses one and two. The, the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And the phrase that's used for that has got this idea of, well, it's a, it's a drinking kind of banquet. Um, so, you know, they're, they're there. Haman's under a bit of duress. The king's delighted to be there with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Now, by this point, it's the third time the king's asked the question. He must be getting a little bit intrigued. Come on, Esther, you've trailed this once. We've come back a second time. You've trailed it again. We're now here the third time. What do you want? And again, his generous offer is up to half the kingdom, which means, look, I'm in a good mood. Try me. You know, another glass of wine. Uh, yeah, go on. Ask for anything you want. And that's where they're at. That's where all this up and down, the, the times have got us to. And now, in the Lord's perfect timing, Esther finally acts. Uh, the, the famous challenge from Mordecai to Esther has been, who knows that you might have been put into royal position for such a time as this. Well, today, 
finally, today is the time. The, the place is the palace. The setting is the banquet. Now, Esther, is your moment. This is the very moment that God has prepared you for. You can almost see her heart beating out of her chest. Her mouth's going a bit dry because this is it. This is your moment. You, you're stepping onto centre stage. There's no more... There's no more prayer and fasting time. There's no more, we'll come back tomorrow for a banquet time. You've now actually got to utter the words. Which is perhaps a familiar situation, isn't it? You know, we might say, I, I want to make Jesus known. And, and then finally, someone gives you an opportunity. And they go, well, you're a Christian. <laughs> and you suddenly go, oh, heart starts thumping a bit faster. What am I going to say? Lord, please help. Here's Esther in that very same, same situation. Verse 3, Queen Esther answered, If I found favour with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life, this is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. Did you see the great humility with which she approaches him? If I found favour, if it pleases you. You know, she, she's really putting the request before him. She's not telling him what to do. She's, she's asking that question. And her request is there, grant me my life. And, and here's the, the king and his wife, the queen, and they're there in this little intimate banquet, and she's going, let me live. Let me live and spare my people. You see, for the first time, she's finally identified with her own people, with God's people, the Jews. She says, I, I'm, I'm one of them. Spare my people. She's kept that quiet up until now. This is a this is a shock-revealing moment for King Xerxes and Haman, who were sat around the table. This is the moment where they sort of spit their wine out and you get the dum, 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 dum. You know, it's the end of the, wow, the moment of, you've, you've finally said you're one of God's people, you've kept that quiet all this time. And her declaration is, spare my life there and also spare my people. It's kind of got that echo of Moses going to Pharaoh, let my people go. And her words echo the edict of, of chapter 3. She, she knows that they're going to be killed, uh, verse 4. The, the description of my people being sold for destruction, slaughter, annihilation. That's exactly what's been mirrored back in chapter 3. And this has been weighing heavily upon her. But now she's, she puts her request to the king. And her request is not only gracious and humble, but it's reasonable, isn't it? Because look at verse 4. If it had just been, uh, if we'd been merely sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. She knows that to be true, because actually she's already living in slavery. She's already living in a foreign land. She goes, well, if I was just going to be sold on as a slave, well, you know, it's kind of the situation we're in already, so I wouldn't have bothered coming. But actually, this is this is life and death, king. And she's acting now in the the Lord's timing absolutely perfectly at the right time in the right place she's there for such a time as this and she speaks up she speaks up as a mediator between the king who's got the power to give and take away life and the people she's mediating between the two and in that sense she points us very clearly to the lord jesus the one who stands between us and god the one who is our great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me except the big difference is Oh, the massive differences. With Esther, it's all been uncertain. Will she? Won't she? Mordecai has to kind of persuade her to step up and she, she wants the prayers of, of her people and the fasting to, to go with her as she does it. And there's, there's been this tension of will she speak up, won't she? What will the king say? But with Jesus, our great high priest, there's no such uncertainty. As he mediates between us and God the Father, we have absolute certainty, security, the forgiveness of our sins and the everlasting life with him well in esther chapter 7 the king is outraged verse 5 is you can obviously see the wine goes everywhere he rages who is he where is the man who dared to do such a thing and this is when it gets slightly comical because he's sitting in the room and there's the three of them she goes someone's going to kill me and he goes raging who's going to do it and haman's going no oh, that'll be me Haman then quakes, we read in verse 6. He's terrified before the king and queen. But there's no sense of regret. There's no element of repentance. No, no, he's just been found out. And so 
the king storms out of the patio doors. He leaves his wine, verse 7. He gets up in a rage, leaves his wine, went out into the palace garden. Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stays behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. And then it gets even funnier because he's kind of wanting to beg her and then he accidentally falls on her just as the king comes back in and says, what, are you even trying to molest my wife now? And, and he's not. He's just tripped over and sort of fallen on the sofa. But it's this, this amazing timing of even the events of him trying to plead for his life. Just as the king returns, he's found in an awkward situation going, no, no, it's not, it's not what you think it is. And then we get, again, the timing is perfect. Because Harbona turns up. He's obviously there in the room or, or, or somewhere in the background, verse 9. Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. He made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. You kind of get the idea that Harbona doesn't like Haman. You know, Haman's not really well liked in the court. Because it's like the king's raging and like, oh, well, I'm going to get this guy. And you go, well, by the way, there's a, there's a pole outside his house. You, you could, you know, drop the suggestion in. Haman's been a vile character, a wicked character. And although there's slightly comical moments here, actually he's not got a hope. His, his pride and his sin has led him into this situation where the, the righteous and just judgment of God comes upon him. For Esther, while well, she's prayed and she's fasted, she's carefully chosen the moment she's acted in the right time, in the right place. And in fact, Haman has kind of like, Put himself up on his own gallows. His pride and sin has led to his downfall. But she's acting as God's mouthpiece as she speaks in God's perfect timing. It's really a fulfilment of, listen to some of the words in, in, in Psalm 7 that says, it's almost like a proverb, he who digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit he has made. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. His violence comes down on his own head. Or, or perhaps if you want to flip it on his head more positively, you, you'd follow Jesus' words and say, uh, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And, and here's Haman reaping the, the rewards of his own evil behaviour. But God's timing is perfect. Esther works and speaks at the right time in the right place as she mediates between uh, the king and the people. But what's really going on here is, is God is sovereignly at work. God is silent, but he's sovereign, and he's working behind the scenes for all these things to come together. All of the little bits of timing of chapter 7, of the fact that Haman's there at the banquet, of the fact of the reaction of the king, and when he sees Haman again, and the gallows pole, and all of that, the, all of these things working together in God's providence. And our God is the same God today as he was then. Can you rest this morning in the unchanging hands of an almighty God. With the big or small circumstances that you're facing, to say, God, I trust you and your timing to be perfect. Because we've seen that throughout Esther, haven't we? The, the, the temptation of Esther to rush in as soon as the king first has said, what do you want, Esther, after half of my kingdom? She's going to just spat it out then. But maybe got into a, a, a war of words with Haman. Well, Haman's kind of <coughs> hanged himself almost quite literally. No, no, he, she's trusted in God's timing. Can you trust in an almighty God this morning, even when you think, well, Lord, the timing should have been yesterday or the day before? God's always working for our good, even when we can't see or understand what he's doing. And Esther acts on the Lord's timing. But then the chapter goes on into chapter 8. We move on into chapter 8 and see a, a love for the Lord's people because... The, the king, well, he, he gives then Haman's estate to Mordecai. He's not only honoured him in the streets, but he's also now given him the estate of Haman. And we know how much the king loved money and wealth and power. So it's a remarkable turnaround that this guy actually gives something away. It's almost Joseph-like in the, the guy who's been in the prison is now second in command as he's put on these, uh, this signet ring and uh, the robes that he's given. It's a remarkable turnaround that this man who is king was so hard of heart he got rid of his first queen in a moment and he's now gracious and humbled see i wonder is it almost beyond our comprehension today that someone in such great power and authority would have his heart changed we go, oh, they'll, they'll never change 
change. Well, this, this king's heart's changed. He's changed as he, as he honours Mordecai and the queen. And as we go on to see in chapter 8, he, he grants their request to save God's people. Perhaps even someone you know in your life, you go, they're so hard of heart, they'll never change. Well, here's God changing the heart of King Xerxes. And from verse 2 to verse 3, there's, there's a gap of a couple of months. Because by the time we get to verse 9, it tells us they're into the, the third month. It, it, it's a little bit later. Uh, so time is ticking on now in chapter 8. And, and after this initial request at the banquet, Esther realises, actually, God's people were still in danger. There's an urgency in the situation. She comes and pleads with the king again. And, and we read in verse 3 of chapter 8, Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite which he had devised against the Jews. And the king extends the gold scepter to Esther and she arose and stood before him. Do you see her, her faith in action now? She's still doing the thing that she's done before. She's obviously entering the king's presence without being requested and he's putting forward the gold scepter. In other words, you get to live again, you know, because you can't come into the king's presence unannounced. She's doing it again. She's got a faith in God who's at work in her. And she realises, I think she'd realise at this point that she's safe. After what's happened to Haman, uh, come the 12th month when this edict against the God's people, against the Jews, is going to be enacted, that they can be killed, I don't think anyone's going to be brave enough to waltz into the palace and go, ha ha, Queen Esther, you're one, oh, we'll, see, we'll see if I can have a go here. No, no, she's safe. After what's happened to Haman, no one's going to touch her, but God's people are not safe. She realises that this evil plan of Haman still hangs over because you can't you can't take away one of the laws once it's been written. The sentence of death still hangs over God's people. And here we see a, here we see a great love she has for God's people. For, for a load of people throughout the kingdom who she's probably not met or doesn't know, she loves them and petitions on behalf of them. And the only possible solution is that this, this second edict is um, enacted and sent out. And you see then that that's exactly what the king says. Uh, verse 5, if it pleases the king and if he regards me with favour and thinks it the right thing to do, again, gracious, humble, gentle, if he's pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches of Haman, uh, son of Hamadath of the Agagite devised, to who wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? Do you see that great love she has for others, uh, uh, God's people? Those other people, she has such great love for them. It's kind of expressed, uh, Paul expresses this in, in the beginning of his letter to the Colossians. A church that he's never met before, he writes these words at the beginning of his letter to the Colossians. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that spring from the hope that's stored up for you in heaven and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. I've never met you, but I've heard about your faith and I love you and I pray for you. What a great response. And here's Esther. She is weeping with compassionate tears, with great love for God's people. And I think that's a great challenge for us, isn't it? Do we love God's people just like Esther loved God's people? Those we've met, those we haven't met. God is passionate about his people. He loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. How much more then should we be loving one another? Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Esther has a love for the Lord's people. But it's to the end of chapter 8 that I want to take you here to finish this morning because it's, there's a great challenge in what happens next. So the edict goes out, and there's lots of mirroring of what's gone on in the early chapters of Esther. So it's gone out to the 127 provinces to say that God's people are going to be destroyed. The edict goes back out by these swift horses to the 120 provinces, all the way from India over to Kush in most of the known world. There's been a great reversal of Haman, who was in high position, who's now been lowered even to death. There's Mordecai, who was in his sackcloth and ashes, now wearing these royal robes. Just look at verse 15. Mordecai left the king's presence, this is after the edict's gone out now, wearing the royal garment of blue and white, 
a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. Well, we've seen that in recent days, haven't we? You can picture that in your mind's eye now, someone in the crown and in the robes, you know, probably with a scepter or two in his hands, out he goes. And look at the response. The city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honour. In every province, in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. Did you get the picture that the writer is trying to get across to us? Joy, gladness, honour, feasting, celebrating. They are rejoicing in the Lord's salvation. God, you've rescued us from this wicked plan of Haman's hand. And it's the absolute opposite of what happened before. Because when the plan was enacted, there was bewilderment in the city of Susa. Now there's joy and gladness, feasting, happiness, holidays. God's people wanted to sing and shout about his great salvation. Even though, <laughs> even though their deliverance hadn't yet happened. Because in one sense, the, 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 the death threat in month 12 hangs over them. This new edict that's gone out basically says you can defend yourself against it. So they're not yet fully saved, but they're rejoicing with great gladness that God had delivered them. How much more should you and I rejoice in the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ? Jesus who came down to earth, who died on a cross, who rose again, who ascended on high, who one day is coming back. How much more should we be full of joy and gladness and rejoicing, even though... Our salvation's not finally seen, because I'm not seeing him face to face yet. Even then. You see, they saw Mordecai in all his royal robes and gown and crown. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour, because he suffered death. So by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You see, the right response to being saved is to rejoice. And as Christians, as those who have been forgiven for their sins and have everlasting life, our, our days should be filled with this, this happiness, this joy, this gladness, this honour. We ought to be rejoicing in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. And do you notice they're living in this time in between? They've got the, the edict that says they can defend themselves, but they're still waiting for that 12th month to come. They, they rejoice in what they have now, even though it's not fully yet seen. That's got to be the same for us, isn't it? Rejoicing in what we have now, even though it's not fully yet seen. I think that it has an impact on those around them, doesn't it? That as, as one city rejoices, the city of Susa, we're told that in every province, everywhere the edict went, there was joy and gladness. There was a, a ripple effect of this joy and gladness that has one lot of God's people rejoiced, the others rejoiced with them. Do we rejoice in God's salvation? It's great to do on a Sunday together, perhaps more difficult on a Monday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Thursday night. But we're to rejoice in the goodness of God to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Your timing is perfect and right. May we act and speak up at those right times. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. May we love your people just as you love them. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. May we rejoice in the salvation we have now in the Lord Jesus, but looking forward to that day when we see him face to face. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and good, that your mercies are new every morning. <coughs> Lord, thank you that all we have needed, your hand has provided. <laughs> we praise you because great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto us, your people. Amen. Amen. Well, let's rejoice in our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we sing together our closing song, In Christ Alone, uh, My Hope is Faithful. Let's get back to the songs. Please stand and we'll be ready uh, to sing.
please do take a seat. Do stay for tea and coffee that will be served at the back of the room. And if you want to stay for lunch, I'm sure there's plenty of food to go around. If you, even if you haven't booked in, you can stay and we can share lunch together after tea and coffee. I'm going to close with a prayer from the end of the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, both now and forevermore. Amen.